All right, I got a great interview. This is live with Mr. Scott Deitch. Is that how you pronounce it? Ditchy. Ditchy. Okay, yeah. that makes it easier. Okay, Ditchy. Yeah. Mr. Scott Ditchy, who is an author, and he loves uh, things about true crime, and he wrote this book called Hitman, The Mafia, Drugs, and the East Harlem Purple Gang. And I always found the Purple Gang very intriguing because they were a, they were a group of Italian men growing up in East Harlem that were not, let's say, the Mafia. They were affiliated, but they weren't like a f crime family, but they got to be kings in the heroin game. And I would love to know most of it from you since you did all this research. First of all, what, what made you want to research the Purple Gang? So when I was researching my previous book, Garden State Gangland, which was an overall history of the mafia in New Jersey, mm -hmm. I was uh, looking up information on the killing of a Genovese mobster, Johnny Coca-Cola Lardier. He was killed uh, in New Jersey in the late 70s. And in researching his particular murder and just, just doing some basic research on it, I found ties to a series of killings that were taking place in New York in the late 70s. And the guns that were used in those killings were tied to this group called the Purple Gang. And, you know, I'd kind of heard the name before. Certainly the Michael Meldish murder had occurred like a couple of years before I started researching Garden State Gangland. So I'm like, oh, so I kind of put a little sticky note on that. And then after Garden State Gangland came out, I, I was like, what would be a really good topic to write about nobody needs another Gotti book. Nobody needs another Capone book. It's you know, amazing. It's amazing how people just can't get enough of Gotti, Capone, uh, Castellano. They just can't get enough of it. But go ahead, continue. Sorry. Yeah, no. So exactly like you're saying, there's there, but there's so many other great stories. So um, I started just doing a little perfunctory research on the Purple Gang. I'm like, oh, this is a really interesting story. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what it was. And then I, you know, pitched the idea to my agent. And um, we went to the publisher that did Garden State, and they're like, "Yeah, we'd be interested in this." So, now they weren't the original Purple Gang, though. Correct, correct. So the original Purple Gang, and there's been a couple pretty good books written about them, were a group of Jewish mobsters uh, that operated out of the Detroit area in the during the primarily the Prohibition era. Um, and uh, this newer Purple Gang, or the East Harlem Purple Gang. You know, one of the things is trying to find out where they came up with the name. It was obviously that that name was tied back to the original Purple Gang. Um, but it was interesting. The law enforcement said that the press came up with the name. The press said law enforcement came up with the name. I call. I talked to people that were around at the time and said, no, those guys got the name from a movie about the Purple Gang from Detroit. So. Nobody knows exactly where the name came from for the East Harlem Purple Gang, but there was definitely a connection back to the original guys. So not only do you get into the Purple Gang and where the original came from and where the name came from, you also give us a short history of the Italian mafia, mafia in Harlem. A lot of people mm -hmm. look at Harlem, they think Bumpy Johnson, they think um, uh, Frank, uh, Frank, uh, help me out. Uh, Lucas, uh, Frank, Frank Lucas, Frank Matthews, they, don't, yeah. they really don't think about the Italian mafia. When Italian mm -hmm. mafia, you think, you think of Bensonhurst, you think of Red mm -hmm. Hook, you think of uh, Howard Beach. Uh, nobody ever thinks, but there was a strong Italian presence in uh, the early 19th century uh, with the Italian mafia. Yeah, um, East Harlem at one time was the largest Italian ethnic enclave in, in the world outside of Italy. It was certainly the largest one in New York City. You know, you think Little Italy now, you think Mulberry Street in that area. But yeah. East Harlem was was a huge Italian immigrant community in the early 1900s. And that it, it continued on through the 1950s. And specifically in its ties to the mafia, uh, you know, a lot of guys were based up there. Guy, early guys like Clutch Amarello, uh, Ciro Terranova. Then even like Joe Valachi was, was born in East Harlem. Fat Tony Salerno later on, you know, he was running his operations at East Harlem. So it, it definitely had a very long and, and very rich history with ties to organized crime. Mm -hmm. And you go all the way to the Black Hand, too. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain to people who don't know what the Black Hand is? Yeah, so the Black Hand was, for lack of a better term, kind of a version of the mafia early on. It was a particular... Um, it was a particular kind of crime and 
basically what happened in is in these early Sicilian or Italian immigrant communities across the United States, you would have these uh, gangster figures. They would either try to extort, threaten, or, or literally sometimes even kidnap successful Italian merchants or businessmen. And they would send these ransom notes with the imprint of a black hand on it and would be like, you know, pay us $200 or, you know, you'll never see your husband again with the black hand. And this, which, which is really interesting, and this is, you know, the early 1900s, there's ties between black hand activity in New York, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, Tampa, New Orleans, all these ethnic enclaves where, you know, newly arrived Sicilian immigrants were coming and part of that, too, was the, the thought that, hey, they're not going to go to the police. We'll take care of this internally. So a lot of the early mafioso actually get their start kind of with this black hand activity. Now, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, the black hand really came to, uh, to a stop when um, they devised the, the five families. Is that accurate? Um, I, I don't know if it necessarily, like, that was exactly the, the like the stopping point. I, I think it was kind of that, that certainly as they got into more sophisticated rackets, I think, you know, extorting your local businessman didn't really become something you wanted to, to get involved in when you can get involved in, say, bootlegging, you know, starting in 1920, you have bootlegging, you have narcotics. Um, also, the, the early black hand, there were actually some pretty successful law enforcement efforts at smashing some early black hand operations. So mm -hmm. I, I think as organized crime got more organized, as the five families became more of a, uh, you really start seeing them form into more cohesive kind of like what we know as crime families. You started moving into into different rackets. And, and I certainly think starting in 1920 with with the advent of prohibition, bootlegging just became a, a bigger moneymaker. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you have the the five families at this point, right? I don't, I don't, I don't remember the mobster that devised the five families, but it's confused with Lucky Luciano who actually started the commission. Do you know that? I, I, I apologize, I don't know the name of him. No, no, I, th I think the five families came around that same time, and. And yeah, it's a little murky. There, there's some really good researchers who specialize in that really early era of organized crime. But but certainly by the late 20s, early 30s, you, you see this emergence of of the five New York families that, that we, we've come to know to this right. day. See, what fascinates me about the Purple Gang is that when, uh, when the five families were devised, you couldn't do anything without their consent, right? I mean, I grew up, and I live in New Jersey now, I'm 46. I grew up in Bensonhurst. And even if you wanted to just be a bookmaker, a loan shark, you couldn't just go out and do it. And what's fascinating about the Purple Gang is they kind of established themselves as a separate entity, even though they were associated with the mafia. They established themselves as a separate entity. How did they do that? And how do they keep, if they did, keep peace between the families and themselves? So, uh, uh where the Purple Gang kind of come from is, you know, East Harlem is a huge epicenter for heroin. One of the biggest centers of heroin trafficking in the United States, especially back in um, back during that time period. Uh, we're talking like late six, middle to late sixties. In the in early nineteen seventies, there's a huge sweep of major mafia guys, including in East Harlem, and Carmine Tremonti from the Lucchese's gets gets swept up. And you have this little bit of a power vacuum on the streets of East Harlem, and in steps the Purple Gang. And there's a couple of unique things about them. These are young guys. They're all in their 20s at that point, um, you know, born like kind of that baby boomer era. So like late 40s, early 50s. Some of them have ties, familial ties to some of the five families. And a lot of them are have familial ties internally, and they all grew up in East Harlem. So they kind of step in and take over this heroin trade that's going on. And they do kind of operate a little bit outside the families. There's some FBI documents I, I found and I, I reference in the book where, you know, they talk about the, you know, the Gambinos and the Genovese talking about how they're going to deal with this, these purple gang guys. And uh, they kind of gain a reputation as this real violent street gang. And, and, you know, in some ways, they served almost like a, as a farm team, kind of like a proving ground for, for the mafia. But just how successful did they get with the heroin trafficking? 
Oh, they were pretty successful. So they they kind of tapped into some of the existing supply chains that exist that were going on at the time. Um, some of the guys like Matthew Madonna is someone who was very closely affiliated uh, member of the Purple Gang in the early 70s. He was a major heroin supplier to Nicky Barnes. Um, some of these guys like F Frank Viserdo Jr. got heavily involved in heroin and, and cocaine to some extent, but primarily heroin. And they were moving significant amounts of heroin throughout the 1970s. And they were also very heavy into guns. Uh, that was more of a late 70s where they got into guns. They would go down to Florida and purchase large quantities of guns and bring them back you know, to the New York area. But, uh, mm -hmm. but they, there was a while there where they were definitely bringing in some cash. Okay. And, the, and did they have to, were they under the thumb of the mafia, the, one of the five families that they have to kick up? Or was it something like they were a wild bunch and they were basically giving the mafia the finger? It, it's hard to really say because some of that's like hyperbole. If you read like some of the news accounts or some of like the DA reports, you know, they were like independent of the mafia. But then, you know, later on, a lot of these guys end up becoming made members. So, you know, they have to be an associate at some point there. So I think of maybe a little bit of both. I think early on they were kind of under the radar, a bunch of kids, for lack of a better term, out there running a little wild. And then by the late 70s, they start becoming more organized. You start seeing them, uh, a lot of them very closely aligned with the Genovese family. Um, and, and as they get older and start becoming more entrenched, they become more part of the structure of organized crime in the New York area. So there's this crazy rumor that the Italian mafia never liked dealing with drugs and so on and so forth, that the extended jail time, how it's not immoral about the neighborhood and so on and so forth. And that's basically a complete falsehood. Uh, some turned a blind eye. Um, some were open to it. Why don't you explain how the Genovese family dealt with the Purple Gang and how they dealt with the idea of uh, utilizing the drugs and the uh, the actual members of the Purple Gang? So... Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. The, the idea that the mafia were never involved in drugs is just simply not true. They were very heavily involved, uh, even dating back to the early 1900s, 1920s. <clears throat> um, so the Purple Gang, you know, they come in off the heels of this these major drug dealers. Um, a, a lot of the guys in East Harlem were tied to Lucchese, some to the Genovese, and, and the Purple Gang kind of move into there. Um, interestingly, I, I would say, they had ties to most, all of the five families, maybe the Columbos the least, but um, the, the ones that were the most heavily involved in drugs, some of them were tied in with, with the Genovese family. And I think at that time too, you get Paul Castellano, you know, becomes boss of the Gambinos. He has this edict, you know, don't deal in drugs. Mm -hmm. You also have the emergence of Rico at the time. So now you get caught dealing drugs with the, the new DEA that's formed in the early 70s on the heels of the Bureau of Narcotics. Like you said, you're looking at long jail sentences. So I, I think while the mafia used to be more kind of turn a blind eye, then they started saying, hey, we'd prefer if you didn't get involved in this because now you get arrested. You're looking at 30, 40 years in prison and you're like, I'm not going to do that. I'll tell you everything you want to know. So you, you start seeing the the breakdown of that. I don't want to say Omar because that's kind of a more of a Hollywood kind of thing. But you start seeing guys facing a lot more serious jail time. So I, I, I think it's kind of a weird dichotomy the, the mafia on one hand kind of holds this myth of, you know, we're staying away from drugs, but a lot of the street level guys are still pretty heavily involved. Right. Yeah. There is, um, I believe there is audio of uh, Gotti's crew before it becomes the boss. And they were trying to get their hands on it before Castellano did. Am I accurate? Because uh, they were basically uh, dealing drugs and it was, mm -hmm. it was the known that if Castellano actually found out, uh, he, he was going to wipe out the whole crew, which was one of the reasons why they turned against Castellano. Uh, was that like that in every other family or were, were every other, were there any families where that even that from the top, they were like, it's making money. I don't care. As long as it's making money. If they get caught, it's their problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, the Bonanno family under Carmine Galante. I mean, Galante was always involved heavily in, in narcotics. So I would say just my opinion, the Bonanos were probably the most deeply entrenched all the way up to the boss position when, when Galante was in charge. So um, 
yeah, there were some families that were a little bit more open to that as opposed to, like you said, the Gambinos, Paul Castellano was, was pretty adamantly against it. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, one could argue he probably knew that some of the guys were doing that and, you know, it was okay yeah. to take the envelope. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's especially during the 70s where heroin was huge and in the mm-hmm. early 70s cocaine became huge and it's very difficult to turn down that kind of money, especially when the other families are, are making that kind of money. And then you have these street gangs like the Purple Gang and like the Westies who are doing the same. What members of the Purple Gang went on to becoming high-ranking bosses of one of the five families yeah so so a few names that that guys who follow organized crime might know angelo prisco who's a who became a gen a pretty powerful genovese crime family member he was an original member of the purple gang uh danny leo who became an acting boss of the genovese for a while uh he's still around i'm not sure uh if he's still considered like in the hierarchy of the genovese family or not uh, Michael Mancuso, who is currently allegedly the head of the Bonanno family, got his start as a Purple Gang member. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there are some people that say Vinny Gorgeous Spaciano was a Purple Gang member. I didn't really find any information, and he's yeah, kind of a younger of generation, so I think yeah. that's more kind of just rumors and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so those are just a few off the top of my head that um, – that became pretty high ranking, high ranking guys. How, how did, what led to the demise of the purple family? Were they just um, all assumed into the, uh, not assumed, but were they all just basically vacuumed into the mafia or was, was, did the police, did the, did the feds come down hard on them or was it a combination of both? So that's an interesting question. So really the, the purple gang only existed for maybe about a decade, a little bit more. Um, by the early 80s, the mafia starts making some of the guys. Uh, you also have some law enforcement activity. Some of them are imprisoned by the early 1980s. There's also, especially in the early years, there's a lot of internal war. There's, man, I think I have over 15 killings that were within the Purple Gang. Really? So, you know, like drug beefs, that type of stuff. So there was a lot of violence associated with the Purple Gang, especially early on. So by the early 80s, the, the gang is not really as active. They're kind of scattered into different families and different areas. The other thing is they kind of follow, you know, the New York suburban. You're in Jersey now. You grew up in New York. So mm-hmm. they grew up in East Harlem. Then they move up to Yonkers or Tuckahoe or Rockland County. So they start, you know, kind of expanding geographically. The Bronx, the the Purple Gang really were, were heavily involved in the Bronx. Um so yeah, by the early '80s, they they really kind of ceased being a thing, mm-hmm. uh, but you still see references to them, and that, that's the other thing I found really interesting is that this allure or this mythology of the Purple Gang, even in the underworld, kind of exists to this day. You know, guys will be like, "Oh, he was a Purple Gang guy," or "He was a member of the Purples. He's a tough guy." So even though they weren't around for you know 20, 30 years, they're they were so well known and, and had such heavy hitters in them that their their reputation definitely extended well past the the life of the gang. Yeah, I didn't even know who the Purple Gang were until the Michael Meldish murder, mm-hmm. and that was two thousand thirteen, I believe. Yeah, two thousand thirteen. Yeah. Why don't you explain who Michael Meldish was, and how he got killed, and how he went from the Purple Gang to being associated with the mafia and so on and so forth. Yeah, so Michael Meldish and his brother Joseph Meldish were early members of the Purple Gang. They're cousins of the Priscos, Angelo Prisco and Pasquale Prisco, who were two original members of the Purple Gang. Uh, they're from East Harlem, eventually moved up to the Bronx, and they were just really known as knockaround guys. And because the Meldishes weren't Italian, they couldn't be made into the mafia. Mm. But uh, they show up a lot in the 70s. Um, they're hired by... Uh, Joseph Pagano, who's a mob, a Genovese mob, I would say capo mob boss, but a capo in uh, in Rockland County. They're arrested for uh, beating up guys and for uh, for mob control of the waste hauling in Rockland County. You see him show up in drug cases. Uh, and then Michael Meldish and uh, his brother, they kind of fall off the radar in the 80s. You don't see a lot about them. Then in the mid-90s, they start showing up again. Michael Meldish is arrested for drug trafficking. Uh, 
uh, Joseph Meldish is involved in, in some uh, violent crimes and eventually uh, he's convicted of murder and uh, sentenced to life in state prison. He, it was a state case, not a federal case. And Michael Meldish is still a hanger on. He's still involved with the Lucchese family. He's associated with the Badano family. And he finds himself both at odds with uh, Mikey Mancuso, the boss of the Bonanos, and Matthew Madonna, who is the acting boss at that time of the Lucchese family. And um, this kind of culminates in, in his killing in, in uh, 2013 in the Bronx. I mean, there's some like uh, rumors. There's a couple of stories of why they killed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I believe one was basically he borrowed money and didn't want to pay it back and basically told him to F off. And then there were other rumors floating around. What was from your research? What did you find out? Yeah. So there's two kind of, you know, he was a, the guys that were eventually convicted of killing him uh, Chris Londino, Terrence uh, Caldwell, uh, Stephen Cray, the boss of the Lucchese family, Matthew Madonna. It had to do with with money that was owed to Matthew Madonna. There was some bad blood in the on the Lucchese side, and that's what led to Michael Meldish's murder. Mm. Um, but also, he was on the outs with Michael Mancuso and the Bonanos. Um, so, from what I've heard, what I've researched, Meldish slept with the girlfriend of Michael Mancuso while Mancuso was in prison. Uh, he put out the order for a beatdown, and they beat up Meldish in front of Rayo's restaurant in East Harlem. Um, and then Meldish attempts to get back to Bananos, and, and him and uh, Caldwell try to assassinate, uh, oh, man, the name's, oh, I just drew a blank, Enzo Stagno, who is a Bonanno soldier. Uh, you know, so there's these different kind of narratives. And, in fact, during the trial, um, the defense tried to bring in this uncertainty of like who killed Michael Meldish and the guys that were defending the Lucchese guys tried to put all the blame on, you know, the Bonanno guys who weren't mm -hmm. uh, in the case who weren't indicted. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I know the cases there's appeals going on currently. And I, and I think a couple of the basis of those has to do with the, some of this uncertainty uh, is to exact. So basically there was no shortage of guys that wanted to see Michael Meldish killed. Yeah, he sounds like a loose cannon. That's what he sounds like. Yeah. 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 Um, there was a, a huge interview on Vlad TV. And I, I've i heard that it this person really made up a fairy tale. Um, it was the interview of uh, Frankie. Was it Frankie Pasqua? Mm -hmm. Was it? Yeah. Him? Big, big, big guy. I believe he's back in jail. And he claimed that his father was the one that actually wound up killing Michael Meldish. And then I heard that wasn't accurate. Yeah, so supposedly they were there that night and that his father was originally given the, the hit. Uh, I talk about it in my book. I, I do delve a little bit into his story. Mm -hmm. um, but more germane, I think it's really kind of interesting, is the background. So Frankie Pasqua's father was a significant mafia drug dealer back into the 1960s. And in the early 80s, um, Frank Sr. and Jr. are uh, indicted in this big case with Dominic Tafaro in this drug case that has ties to the Purple Gang. So mm. it, it's kind of this, you know, there's a lot of interconnectivity there between his story and the history of the Purple Gang and the, and the drug gangs. But ultimately, um, and I, I, I don't recall offhand, and, and forgive me, I, I'd have to look it up, if he was actually used in the case or the, the FBI d determined he was... I think they determined he was unreliable uh, uh, and eventually d decided not to use him as a witness in the case. Or if they did later on after the fact, it came out that, you know, there were a lot of inconsistencies in his story that didn't match the, mm. the timeline that the feds were putting out there. Oh, I see. OK. I'm going to go back a little bit, back to the 70s. And in East, in East Harlem, from what I know, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert. Uh, oh. They called him Tough Tony Salerno, Fat Tony, whatever you want to call him. He was yeah. pretty much, he, from what I understand, he really was the person who had the stronghold on East Harlem for the Genovese. Mm -hmm. And he, for his reputation was really no joke. He was a no-nonsense kind of guy from the information I gathered. How did he deal with the Purple Gang? Because if there were such loose cannons, I don't see how he would just let that go. Uh, that, that's interesting because I never saw or never came across any direct like 
interactions or, or connectivity between the Purple Gang and, and Fat Tony. And I think there might be a little bit of a timeline reason for that. As Tony Salerno starts to rise up in the Genovese family uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, and, and there's, there's an argument to be made. He was never a, even really the official boss. Yeah. But as he becomes more powerful, the Purple Gang has started to dissipate. So, you know, the Purple Gang is really big in the early to mid 70s. And then Salerno starts to ascend, you know, a little bit later on. Uh, he very well may have met with them and known some of the guys. Certainly, like I said, some of them had family members that were Genovese. So uh, I'm sure he was aware of what was going on. Okay. But uh, I, I never saw anything like specifically said, hey, these guys met with Salerno at that time. Right, right, right. And just to clear it up, the 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 there is tape from what I understand. There is audio tape of Salerno actually talking about the real boss and how he's on in the street having to deal with everything. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the real boss is actually doesn't have to deal with this crap and so on and so forth. More like he's venting and complaining. Would you like yeah. to talk about who the actual real boss was? <laughs> Well, I, so again, even talking to guys that were on the street, you know, was it uh, was it Lombardo? Was it Giganti? Um, uh, there, there's still some. There's a good argument to be made that there are a couple different guys that kind of power shifted between. Uh, you know, Jerry Catina was offered the position. He kind of turned it down. Uh, this is in the mid '70s, and he was in prison in New Jersey at that time. Um, but, you know, Gigante eventually, you know, emerges as the boss and he might have been boss when Salerno was convicted in the commission trial, too. Right. Now, and that just goes to show you the generation difference. If that's true, because Tony Salerno died in prison, right? Mm hmm. And never cooperated. Never. I mean, that is old school gangster. If, if those if that is true and he really wasn't the boss and, and he was the street boss. That is old school gangster. You were never going to get a guy like that in the Italian mafia again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Uh, and also, he, you know, he smoked a cigar in handcuffs when he was being brought in on the perp walk. So something to be said for that. <laughs> yeah, and it was a great line that he used when they asked him if uh, if he want if they had if he had anything to say while he was, and he said, "Go fuck yourself." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, although I, I will throw out there that I, uh, one of my next. My next project, potentially, uh, I, I think maybe the most underrated and unheralded power in the Genovese family was Jerry Catina uh, mm -hmm. out of New Jersey. And, you know, he he died of old age in his house in Florida. And that's wow, something really? very few, yeah. very few of those guys could say they did. And yeah, uh, exactly. I think he's a fascinating character and may potentially be a be a subject. I, I, I think, again, a story of a guy that just not much written about and right for yeah the reason more. why i brought up yeah i mean that would be a fantastic all these little hidden gems because there are a lot of old school guys that really uh, really uh went by the rule of you know not being flashy mm -hmm. under the radar or organized crime i mean there's that great line in uh, scarface where frank lopez says to al pacino he says um the ones who fry low silent those are the guys that last the ones that want it all those are the guys that don't last. Mm -hmm. And there and there are these old school guys that you would have never heard of. I mean, there is there is a guy from my parents' neighborhood. My my parents grew up in Red Hook. And till this day, um, anybody from that neighborhood knows who he is, but till mm -hmm. this day, nobody ever brings him up. I mean, he's never a subject on anything, and his name was Frankie Martin or Frankie Baranka. And I don't even know what. Never heard I, of. <laughs> yeah, I believe he was with the uh, Gambinos, but his name all over Red Hook. It was like, you know, he said his name, and it was just fear. It was unbelievable. Anyway, getting back to the Purple Gang. The reason why I asked you about Tony Salerno is because I, I see like a. It seems as like the Purple Gang were a bunch of kids that were getting a, making a lot of money doing drugs, but they were kind of loose cannons. They were killing, murdering, uh, dealing guns. And I see a correlation between them and the Westies. And the reason why I asked for to about Tony Salerno is because Castellano had this idea, well, if I just bring the Westies under my thumb and under me, I can control them, which it didn't mm -hmm. work. But I was wondering if there was any kind of correlation like that with any kind of mafia figure and the Purple Gang, or were they just kind of absorbed one at a time like a, like a farm team? 
Yeah, it, it was a little bit different because the Westies, you know, can never be made right. guys. Um, right. So bringing them in your fold, partnering with DeMeo and his crew, that kind of thing. Uh, there is an interesting, so I talked to TJ English, who, I, who I've known for, for quite some time, and um, I was asking him about the origin of the Westies name and how that kind of parallels like the Purple Gang in that somebody came up with this name, probably someone from law enforcement or the media, and then the gang starts using it amongst themselves to describe each other. Uh, but, you know, it, it is kind of a parallel in a sense that this is this little offshoot gang that's self-contained, uh, becomes kind of a media sensation. One thing about a good parallels, you know, the Westies, all of a sudden it become the hot thing that all the newspapers are reporting about the Westies, this, the Westies, that. It was like that for the Purple Gang. In between 1977 and 78, there were uh, close to 100 articles about the Purple Gang. A lot of them were reprints of of kind of these AP stories that, that people were writing. But it was like for two years, the Purple Gang, this was the new mafia, the new mafia family. And kind of similar to the way the Westies, all of a sudden, like for two years, it was, you know, the Westies, the most violent gang in, you know, New York, that kind of stuff. So there, there is a little bit of parallel there. But, you know, the, the advantage the Purple Gang had were these guys could get made and they were eventually made. Okay, I see. If you can discuss in a little bit of detail of the dynamic between the Purple Gang and the the major black gangsters or major black drug dealers in Harlem. Well, like you said, we, we mentioned Bumpy Johnson and Frank Lucas. I believe there was one guy called, they called him the Black Caesar. I think he came a little bit before them. If you can discuss a little bit of that. Yeah, probably the, the closest one was Nicky Barnes, who, you know, became really very Nicky well Barnes, known. I apologize. I said yeah. Bumpy Johnson. So. I know. Uh, um, well, he was in Harlem, but just a generation before. But, uh, yeah, um, Nicky Barnes' main supplier was Matthew Madonna, and he, you know, there's testimony in court, or because you know Nicky Barnes later testified in court um, that these the Italians were his main supplier for a lot of the heroin that he was dealing. And Matthew Madonna and guys from the Purple Gang were closely tied in with Nicky Barnes, and there were some other lesser known guys uh, that were dealing in Harlem at the time, like Frank Vicerdo Jr. partnered with a few. Um, and there were some some other ties there to guys that probably wouldn't be known by by most people. But, yeah, there were definitely some interconnectivity between the, the black dealers in Harlem and the Italian dealers in East Harlem. Now, were they at that point, were the Purple Gang and Nicky Barnes and whomever, were they were they meet as equals? Yeah, I, I think they were equals and, you know, they, they kind of needed each other for a while. And, you know, some of the, the the black dealers eventually turned to other suppliers. And, you know, you have change of, of types of drugs that are available. Uh, you know, cocaine comes on the scene and, you know, that, that's a whole nother thing, how the mafia were never able to capitalize on cocaine. Mm -hmm. So but when heroin was king and, and the mafia were controlling the supply, they were the main source of supply then they, were, you know, they definitely needed each other because this was a really good customer base for the mafia and this was a real good supply for the other dealers. Where would the mafia get these the drugs from? What was their source? So uh, it's funny, I was just talking to someone the other day about this. So, you know, the breakup of the French connection in early 62 really kind of put a dent in some of the European supply. But some of it was still coming out of Europe and that was originating out of the Middle East through... Corsica, Sicily was being processed there. Some of it was being shipped into New York, some of it via Montreal. And that was more of the Bonanno connection with Montreal. And then Southeast Asia starts becoming a, uh, an important source. So heroin's coming from Southeast Asia into the United States and some of it also coming up through through Mexico. So those are kind of the three areas. Uh, but, but I would say probably most of the stuff in New York that the East Harlem Purple Gang were dealing was primarily from Europe across Atlantic trade uh, with some of it being supplemented from Southeast Asia. Okay, I see. Obviously Denzel Washington made this great movie about Frank Lucas and how he was the first major black drug dealer that supposedly didn't get his drugs from the Italians. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? From what I understand, there was somebody before him. 
yeah, I didn't d- dig too much into that, but he, he, Frank Lucas definitely really established a direct connection with Southeast Asian suppliers and himself. Okay. Uh, not really sure if, uh, if there was, there might've been someone before him. I just don't know. Offhand. Well, I believe it was his name, his nickname was the Black Caesar. It was during the sixties. And then okay. I'm pretty sure he went on the lamb and was never found again. But I, I, I might be um, inaccurate, but I'm pretty sure. No, that was Lucas. Lucas has never been found. He's still on the lamb. Oh, really? All right. I might yeah. be mixing up the two. Okay. Yeah. All right. Were there any actual uh, beefs or problems between the Purple Gang and other gangs, like the Westies or other gangs, um, maybe for drugs or territory, not much territory, but more like uh, drug territory, if you will? Not really. Uh, mo- like I said, most of it was internal, like guys in the neighborhood and, and little factions maybe within the Purple Gang uh, that were having beefs. Uh, and this was really early on. This was in the early 70s when the gang was really young. So by the mid to late 70s, the gang is still implicating a lot of murders, but they kind of become almost hit men, hence the title of my book, and also suppliers of, of guns for a lot of these murders that are taking place in New York. A lot of them are tied back to the Genovese family. Mm. So they, they go from being kind of wild cowboys who are killing each other to kind of, you know, hit men for hire and, and gun suppliers for other hit men uh, for the Genovese family. And, and just a quick aside, I, I don't think, and I didn't know until I started researching it, how violent the 70s were in the mafia. How many killings there were, like, <laughs> lo- like not even the big guys, like and, low level killings. It wasn't like, even just the mafia; it was New York City. Uh, yeah, New York City in general, but the mafia. The if you, bad. yeah, if you look at the body count from the mafia, it, it's it's crazy. It, yeah, I was I, mean, you, I was really live, surprised. <laughs> you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So, yeah. You know, I don't know how else you would keep criminals, felons, ho- hooligans, whatever you want to call them, in line if you can't threaten them with with death. Yeah, because they would just be, you know, they would just be ransacked. They would just Mm -hmm. run ransacked, you know, as we saw with the Westies when they were under the thumb of Castellano, they actually took advantage of the fact that they were working for him and started killing anybody they wanted. Yeah. Right. Is that accurate? Yeah. Um, Explain how they went from uh, being heroin dealers to hitmen for hire to uh, gun smugglers, because from what I, the little bit I know about the Italian mafia, you don't get paid for a hit. It's it's more like a you know, uh, a promotion almost. Like, well, if you do this, well, you you know, we'll we'll consider you for initiation. We'll consider you for um, you know, when we open the books, you becoming made later on, and so on and so forth. So explain yeah, I, how that worked. So I think that was part of it. Some of these killings were probably favors to the okay. to the mafia. Some of them like. Um, uh, Arthur Milligram, who was in business with Frank Vicerito and Richard Rocco from the Purple Gang, you know, he was killed to get him out of the way so they can, you know, move into the business. So some of it was business related. Some of it was kind of favors. And then getting into the guns was interesting. So Frank Vicerito Jr., whose father was with the Genovese uh, and his uncle as well. So he um, he suddenly starts making these trips to, to Florida in, in the mid seventies and, and bringing back some pretty significant amount of, of guns. And this one particular batch of 22s shows up uh, when ballistics are done, shows up in about a dozen killings of suspected mob informants and police informants in the New York city area in really? 76, 77, 78. Uh, and later ballistics tests that were done in the early eighties, uh, I think it was three or four of these were traced to one single gun that was part of the shipment that the Purple Gang brought up to New York. Um, and, and again, Florida, a lot easier to buy guns. New York, not so much. You go down there, you buy a bunch, you bring them up here, you, you put them on the street. Okay. Were any of those um, guns, gun killings tied back to any famous uh, mafia hits, any famous mafia murders? Well, uh, Johnny Coca-Cola, I mentioned before, which is kind of a pretty well-known murder, especially in New Jersey, mob lore. Because um, when when the hitman came up to Johnny, Johnny's like, what are you going to do now, big guy, or something? And then the guy shot him. Well, explain, um, explain that. Who who? What's it? What was his name? Because I've never heard of him. Because Yeah, heard. Johnny Lardier. He was a Genovese uh, crime family guy. He was in mm-hmm. prison in New Jersey in the 70s. So 
um, just a quick aside, in the in early 1970s, New Jersey established the State Commission of Investigation, uh, which are still active. And they did a lot of re, um, investigation into organized crime in New Jersey, and they subpoenaed a bunch of mobsters. And when the mobsters refused to testify, they were jailed for contempt. And Johnny Lardier was one of those that were jailed for contempt. And he was let out for a weekend furlough, and that's when he was killed. Um, there were other guys like uh, James Quelly, who was a, a principal in the Ironbound section in Newark. He was also a habitual gambler tied into the Genovese yeah. family. But but the interesting thing is not necessarily some of the guys that were killed, but who they all tie back to in the Genovese family, which was a, a guy named John DeGilio and people who follow Mafia Lord. The, the name John DeGilio probably rings a bell. He was a very powerful Genovese uh, figure in New Jersey. And he was eventually killed too himself in, in the 1980s. Wow. It's, it's, it's amazing how it was just, it was like the old West back in yeah. the 70s oh. and 80s. It really was. Well, one other killing that, that the purple gang were tied into um, actually occurred in Florida in 1987. It was a guy named Don Aronow and he was known as the founder of Donzi and cigarette boats. He was one of the biggest uh, speedboat makers and speedboat racers in South Florida and he was killed in this killing in 1987. And through the investigation that this this one author did and through through further follow up, um, it was found out that he was really good friends with Frank Vicerdo and Paul Cayano from the Purple Gang. And they actually looked at the Purple Gang as potentially being responsible for his murder. Uh, there was a local drug dealer who was later convicted for it. But, um, you know, they, they they show up in weird places like, you know, the you know, height of the cocaine cowboys era of Miami. Mm, okay. Yeah. That was a great movie, by the way. Great documentary. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. For sure. Your research. Did you have to, did, did you meet with any former purple gang members, former mafia members, maybe mafia members now that you can't say their name and actually discuss from people that were around at the time? Yeah, I reached out to a few guys, you know, a few guys on YouTube, um, you know, the, the mob tube guys, X, Y's guys, and mostly it was recollections of, because a lot of them are younger generation. So it was, hey, oh yeah, I knew this guy, he was a purple or I knew about him. Um, I tried reaching out to a couple people that were close to Purple Gang. I, I didn't get as much from them, but I, I did get a couple interesting calls and, and one gentleman um, in particular, who was very close around Nikki Barnes and some of the stuff going on in East Harlem. He, he was he found out I was doing the book and through the grapevine somewhere and, and called me and uh, ended up talking my ear off and gave me some really, really good kind of like on the ground, early 70s East Harlem uh, flavor for the book. Are you able to say their names or no? It's OK if you can't. Oh, yeah, it was. um Oh, damn. What's his first name? His last name is Geronimo. He passed away recently, uh, okay. but he was um, he was involved in the drug game in, in East Harlem. OK. And the YouTubers that you I probably have. Yeah, like John there. A. Light, um, yeah, uh, had, Gene Borello, you know, some of those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Gene Borello. John was, was uh, John was a big help. He reached out to a few people. Uh, he, uh, I know he did that. For that me. Couple. I was on his podcast, actually. Uh, he was he did a, a podcast with him and uh, the cop. The crooked cop. What the hell? Is oh, that? Michael Dowd. Michael Dowd. And yep. I was friendly with a couple of guys that knew them, and they actually let me go down there and come on their podcast and promote my own channel. Oh, it's nice. Yeah, that was really great of them. And he actually got me an interview with Hootie Russo. He reached out to him for me. I mean, I mean, he, for me, it was nothing but a gentleman. We went out to dinner after the after I was down mm -hmm. in uh, Boca and whatnot. Nothing but a, a gentleman. You know, they, I think there were some guys that now don't get me wrong. I mean, he still has that aura and energy about him, and I wouldn't want to find out if it's still in him or not, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I went to dinner with him, and we would, and you could see, and it was just, it was just like, you know, we didn't have to pay for anything, right? It was like, you know, like the movie, right? The Goodfellas, <laughs> you don't pay for anything, and um, but some of the guys that come out, you could kind of tell they've made one eighties and they're trying to change, and they're yeah. trying to lead better wives, and some of them you could tell. They're still just that same street thug. <laughs> well, I tell you, who was another huge help for me it was John Panisi. Uh, John John's a really good guy. Uh, I've been on his podcast, and he's uh, yeah, he was real helpful. Yeah, 
I yeah, had to he, reach out to him. Okay, good. Yeah, he's he was a really big help, John. Like I said, in fact, I had lunch with John. We interviewed him for our Tampa Mafia magazine back, uh, oh, maybe almost a decade ago. John um, Panisi, can you um, go into him a little bit? And what? His oh yeah, he was an ex Lucchese guy. He's more recent, but he uh, he spent some time with with a in prison with a few guys that were connected to the Purple Gang. Um, so he he was a big help in giving me some background. Okay. So uh, and then a couple guys that. I prefer not to say uh, I've reached out. They're not on YouTube or anything, but just kind of. That's fine. Not a problem. Not at all. I, yeah. Believe me, I completely understand. But, um, and then Jeez. law enforcement, you know, I, I reached ah, out to a couple of cops. Of yeah. yeah. Sure. Retired Cop, cops. Retired cops are great. They, yeah. they're, they. Yeah. Cops love to talk about. Yeah. Cops. cops. <laughs> agents. I actually um, interviewed uh, Elon Lifshitz, who's a currently active justice department. Um, U.S. Attorney in, in Manhattan. He was great. Uh, he gave me some some really good stuff. Not specific stuff on current, but like you know, Justice Department's kind of view on the mafia and drugs, and and you know, his view of the Purple Gang as a historical entity, and uh, that was really good. But yeah, law enforcement guys are usually very very willing to open up and, and yeah. Tell you that's, stuff. Are you kidding? They, they that's they love talking yeah. about. Um, yeah, that's that's what they famous for <laughs> yeah did you know when you research and you talk to all these different gentlemen did you see the did the timeline and the events line up accurately yeah for the most part they they did for the most part they did um this this was a this was a weird book in in research sense so generally when i start a book i have a ton of information that i have to condense this is one where i didn't have a lot i had to kind of extrapolate out and the the bad thing is that most of this research and writing I did was during COVID. So a lot of my usual like you know, places you can, like if you make a FOIA request to the FBI pre-COVID, you can get it within eight to 10, maybe a year. Post-COVID, it was like 18 to 24 months, you know, to get these files and stuff back. Right, 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 so right. It, it put a little... So I had to be creative in, in some of the research and, and the way I, I did. But I was able to get some really good DEA documents. Um, I, I kind of made friends with a guy at the DEA archivist, and he was giving me some stuff. So I was able to really kind of match stuff up, not only what was in the newspaper or what I heard from other people, but what's in you know, law enforcement documents, court cases, things like that. Were you able to go down to the neighborhood itself? You know, I had previously... Um, uh, uh, maybe in, in 2019, actually, and I was planning to go back and spend some time there. But again, COVID came. And because, you know, when I sign a book contract, I have a deadline. And my deadline was like a month after everything opened up. So it just time wise, didn't really work to go that but I have been up. And I walked, you know, up and down Pleasant Avenue and, mm -hmm. and kind of went to a lot of the places that that I eventually wrote about in the book. Is there still an element of the Italian mafia there or it's all gone? No, it's all gone in yeah. East Harlem. Yeah, there, there's not much, you know, from my, from outside looking in, because I don't live in the neighborhood or, you know, don't have a background in it. it, it well, seems... I happen to work in Harlem, actually. Okay. Me. It yeah. seems like it's gentrifying somewhat. It is. Sure. Un but where I, where I yeah. work specifically, I am right on the Hudson mm -hmm. and, and they have a boardwalk and it's absolutely beautiful. And Columbia University has built these amazing buildings and, and uh, college dorms and so on and so forth. It's unbelievable. And it's re it really is. It's really, what a difference, you know, tremendous yeah. difference. I mean, don't yeah. get me wrong. I mean, you still have your CD parts, right? But uh, the difference is night and day. Like you can like, you know, I, I, I some, there were times I go to 125th Street and go shopping or go to a store or whatever, you know, it's no problem whatsoever. In the 70s, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, the '80s, that right? That would, that would. Yeah, yeah. So, back when I went into New York, I don't know I look at it now. I was a, in high school. We used to skip. I grew up in New Jersey and go into like Alphabet City. And it's oh. like '88, '89 during like the height of the crack wars. And and as a parent now, I'm like I I would go crazy. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, they don't even think they call it Alphabet City anymore, right? Yeah. Uh, they they yeah, have another yeah. name for it. I don't forgot but, what it was, but they don't. Yeah, call it's it changed City. a lot. Yeah, definitely. New York City is completely uh changed but uh but you know there's still like east harlem and that area there's still rayos there's still some of the yeah. old a lot of the old buildings you know one of the things is kind of cool is you can like you know go up to the brownstone that clutch and morello 
you know, was operating out of in the early 1900s. That's still the same brownstone it is now, obviously updated and changed. But, you know, a lot of those, the one really good thing about a neighborhood like East Harlem is those historic buildings and those places are still there. They might not be the same business, but the building's still there. Whereas you go to other parts, whether it's here in Florida or in Las Vegas and, you know, most of those old historic mob affiliated places are long torn down or mm -hmm. gone. I'm going to ask you one question and then we're going to plug your book. You're going to tell me where you can get sure. it. What other books you, you got uh, for sale? Um, the other question that I wanted to ask is it seems like it used to be, uh, it used to be that the new immigrants coming in to the major cities in the United States they had formed a, they would form an, a, a crime syndicate, right? You had the Irish and the Jewish and you had the Italians and then you had, uh, you know, the uh, Hispanics. I don't see that much anymore. Or is it just so, is it just so hidden? Or is it the fact that the forensics and technology is so great that they can't? Oh, I, I think organized crime has changed in that it's more transnational now. You you don't, you probably still have localized gangs and stuff like that, obviously. And, and some of them, you can, you can make the argument that some of the bigger gangs are kind of like organized crime syndicates. But now your big syndicates are cartels, mm. you know, East Asia, Eastern European organized crime groups. Even the, the Italian groups like the, the Calabrians or the Neapolitans, they're operating all over the world. They're mm -hmm. interconnected worldwide. So that local neighborhood ethnic gang isn't really as, you know, it, it might still be a gang, but it'll never get to the mafia because you already have these larger groups there. So um, right. So I think just the, the dynamic of organized crime has changed from, from the early 20th century. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I believe so, too. I think you're pretty accurate on that. Listen, it was it was great interviewing you. It was yeah, a tremendous was interview. Great. It was a, a great uh, world of knowledge. And here's your book, Hitmen, The Mafia, Drugs, and the East Harlem Purple Gang. Where could people get this book? Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore available all over. What other books do you have for sale there, too? Oh, uh, this is my eighth book. Uh, wow. So my first two, Cigar City Mafia and The Silent Don, are about the mafia in Tampa. Uh, the, the other one, I think people would like Garden State Gangland. It's the first ever overall history of the mafia in New Jersey. Um, and uh, if you're ever down in the Tampa area, I, I run a Tampa mafia tour uh, of the historic Ybor City neighborhood. So you can find out information on either scottditchie.com or tampamafia.com. All right, great. So go out and get this book. It's a great read about a, a tremendous, tremendous time in New York City history and a very violent time that doesn't exist anymore. Scott, thank you very much. Oh, and also, people out there, don't forget to subscribe and like to my channel because I got to make a living too. <laughs> Scott, thank you very much, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Yep.